For the moral consciousness itself, however, its moral view of the world does not mean that consciousness develops therein its own notion and makes this its object. It is not conscious of this antithesis either as regards the form or the content. It does not relate and compare the sides of this antithesis with one another, but in its development rolls onward without being the notion which holds the moments together. For it knows only the pure essence or the object so far as it is duty, so far as it is an abstract object of its pure consciousness, as a pure knowing, or as its, its own self. It thinks, therefore, only in abstractions and does not comprehend, that is, in terms of the notion. Consequently, the object of its actual consciousness is not yet transparent to it. It is not the absolute notion, which alone grasps otherness as such, or its absolute opposite, as its own self. It does indeed hold its own reality, like all objective reality, to be unessential. But its freedom is the freedom of pure thought, in contrast to which, therefore, nature likewise has arisen as an existence that is equally free. Because both are equally present in it, that is, the freedom of mere being and the inclusion of this being within consciousness, its object becomes one that has being, but at the same time exists only in thought, in the last stage of the moral view of the world. The content is explicitly such that its being is given to it by thought, and this conjunction of being and thought is pronounced to be, in fact, what it is, imagining. In paragraph 611, we are now starting to approach the end of this section. There's a kind of downward slide taking place that we're going to see. Hegel is going to be contrasting the notion or begriff, the concept, with what is here translated as imagining for Stalin. And we've seen this play itself out many times already within the phenomenology. Whenever there's for Stalin, or for Stellung, uh, we can translate it as representation. Here it's being translated as imagination, which works just fine. And that is always going to be lesser than the concept. So what does this mean then for the moral consciousness, or he says, the moral view of the world, the moral, moralisches Weltanschauung, right? How is that being worked out here? There's a slippage that's now occurred. So he says, for this moral consciousness, the moral view of the world does not mean that consciousness develops therein its own notion. It's not grasping itself conceptually. And he says it doesn't make it its object. What does this mean? He goes on, and, he, and this is a very important phrase here, it is not conscious of this antithesis this Gegensatz, contradiction. And notice what he says here. Either as regards the form or as the content. Why would grasping its form or content be important in this case? Well, these are both two aspects of what makes something what it is. And they're different from each other. You know, a form is at a higher level, content is more determinate. And he's saying it's not getting any of these. Now, why would that be the result of this entire uh, development within this long section? Because moral consciousness turns out to be a bit more complicated than was originally thought. It's going to get simplified here. But the simplification ends up being a missing it, a loss, a inadequacy. So he goes on and he says, um, it does not relate and compare the sides of this antithesis with one another, but just rolls forward. It jumps right ahead to having something that it can work with as an object. He says, it knows only the pure essence or the object insofar as it is duty. And Hegel calls this abstract, an abstract object of its pure consciousness, a pure knowing or its own pure self. So what it's working with here is something that is more malleable for it, that is more satisfying for it, but has gotten away from the complex reality of moral consciousness. So he talks about this as, as being thinking in terms of abstraction, which means that it's not going to grasp the notion. And 
here's something kind of useful for us to keep in mind. When we see the word Vorstellen or Vorstellung, and we think in terms of representation, we will often think in terms of sensuous representations or schemas like what I put on, on the chalkboard, as opposed to the conceptual grasping of it. And we lose sight of the fact that these are abstractions. In some sense, the thinking subject being taken out of it makes everything abstract. So representations may be particular, but they are abstract. So he goes on and he says, what have we lost here? The object of its actual consciousness is not yet transparent to it. It's not the absolute notion which grasps otherness as such. And we've seen otherness coming up in the previous paragraphs. Um, nor does it grasp its absolute opposite as its own self. Typical Hegelian dialectic there. So what does it get? He says it does indeed hold its own reality to be unessential, but its freedom is the freedom of pure thought in contrast to which nature has arisen as an existence that's equally free. We saw this entire dialectic play itself out earlier. We've got nature versus duty, happiness versus duty, all of these things coming together. And consciousness was making sense out of it uh, as moral consciousness, but now it's lost a hold of that. And what does it gain in its place? This thinking of being, freedom of mere being, right? That's nature. And the inclusion of this being within consciousness. He says its object becomes one that has being, but at the same time exists only in thought. So what kind of being only exists in thought? An imagination, right? He says the, uh, in, in the last stage of the moral view of the world, the content is explicitly such that its being is given to it by thought. And this conjunction of being and thought is pronounced to be what it is, in fact, imagining, Vorstellung. And this is viewed as a good resolution by some people, but Hegel is saying this is inadequate. When we consider the moral view of the world in such a way that this objective mode is nothing else than the very notion of moral self-consciousness, which it makes objective to itself, this awareness of the form of its origin gives rise to its exposition in another shape. The first stage which forms the starting point is the actual moral self-consciousness or the fact that there is such a moral self-consciousness. For the notion gives it this explicit character, that is, that all reality in general has essential being for it only so far as it is in conformity with duty, and this essential being it characterizes as knowledge, that is, as an immediate unity with the actual self. Hence, this unity is itself actual. It is a moral, actual consciousness. This now, qua consciousness, pictures its content to itself as an object, that is, as the final purpose of the world, as harmony of morality, and all reality. But, since it thinks of this unity as object and is not the notion which has mastery over the object as such, the unity is a negative of self-consciousness for it, or it falls outside of it as something beyond its actual existence, and yet at the same time is something that also has being, but a being existing only in thought. Paragraph 612 takes off from the Vorstellen, the imagining that was taking place in the previous paragraph, this being existing only in thought, having a place only in thought and is recapping the movement that has taken place so far. You notice that here Hegel is talking about a first shape, or it's also translated here uh, rather paraphrastically as stage, a gestalt. Uh, so he's, he's rehashing what we've gone through already. And in the paragraphs yet to come, he's going to flesh this out further. So he says... When we consider the moral view of the world, what's involved in the moral view of the world, in such a way that this objective, this gegenständliche mode, is nothing else than the very notion of moral self-consciousness, which it makes objective to itself, that is, it makes moral self-consciousness something that is consciousness of itself as something that is doing something in reality, in the world, 
either acting or being within the world, when it makes it objective in this way, he says the, this awareness of the form of its origin gives rise to its exposition, its darstellung, its being set forth, being, being uh, put out there in another shape, in, in a, another stage. So he says the first stage, which forms the starting point, is actual, virklika, moral self-consciousness, which we've talked about quite a bit. Or, this is very important here, because Hegel's going to turn this into the mirror image of another proposition, there is moral self-consciousness, something that we can assert to ourselves. Now, when we do so, of course, we aren't just sitting back and saying, oh, that's so interesting, there's moral self-consciousness. I wonder what it will do. <laughs> this is practical. We say, oh, there's moral self-consciousness. Wait a second, that's me. I'm moral self-consciousness, and so should you be. So we're, we're aware of it through ourselves and as something that's, that's there. He goes on and he says, the notion gives this, it, this explicit character that all reality in general has essential being for it only insofar as it's in conformity with duty. Now, does that mean that only duty exists? No, only has essential being insofar, it's only, you might say, fully being insofar as it's in accordance with duty, which means that we ourselves are transforming being, both the being outside of ourselves and the being that is ourselves, precisely by imposing this notion of duty or plict, right, obligation onto it, and then acting accordingly, choosing accordingly, aligning ourselves with that duty, making the duty be real, wirklich. So he says, this essential being it characterizes as knowledge, wissen, uh, as an immediate unity with the actual self. And we know ourselves not just in terms of sort of theoretical knowledge, but practically in relation to duty. This is nothing new. We've already talked about this quite uh, quite great length in the previous paragraphs. So he says, hence this unity is itself actual. It is, that is, it has being, a moral actual consciousness. Now, how do we get from there to somewhere else? He says, this now, as consciousness, pictures or imagines its content to itself as an object. It makes it gegenständlich. It makes it something it can manage. And here we saw that there, there were several different antitheses that were being talked about. One of them has to do with the final purpose of the world, the Enzvek, the goal that is the goal of goals, right? What is that? A harmony between morality and reality, wirklichkeit, actuality, you could say as well, if you want to. So how do these get harmonized? You know, we saw that there isn't really any genuine existence of this, this harmony, but it is something that we have to think. We have to postulate it. That was what Kant said, and Hegel's been working through that entire dynamic. So he says, since it thinks of this unity as an object and is not the notion. Now notice, we started with being the notion, and now we've got a slippage. We've lost the notion. It's not the notion which has mastery over the object as such, the unity is a negative of self-consciousness for it. This unity falls outside, Hegel says, of self-consciousness. And what does that mean? It says it be, it, it's beyond its actual existence. And, and we know this. Do we ever see a harmony of morality and reality or actuality, whether out in the world or even within ourselves? No, we're a mess. The world's a mess. And yet we do have these moral norms there that are saying, you should do this. Don't do that. How do we actually work through this? So he says it's beyond our, its actual existence. And yet at the same time, something that also has being. How does it have being? Being existing only in thought, imagining, right? This is going to lead us to the second shape or stage, which Hegel doesn't identify at this point, but which comes up in the next paragraph. 
This self-consciousness, which qua self-consciousness is other than the object, is thus left with the lack of harmony between the consciousness of duty and reality, and that too its own reality. Accordingly, the proposition now runs as follows. There is no moral, perfect, actual self-consciousness. And since the moral sphere is at all only insofar as it is perfect, for duty is a pure, unadulterated, intrinsic being or in itself, and morality consists only in conformity to this pure in itself, the second proposition simply runs. There is no moral existence in reality. Now, in paragraph 613, Hegel is spelling out for us what the consequences are of this lack of harmony, this nicht harmony, this loss, this discordance that is going on. And the Miller translation can be a little bit misleading on this point uh, because Hegel does not actually talk of a consciousness of duty and a consciousness of reality at the lexical level, although there's no reason why you couldn't read that in, but, but I wanted to just call that to mind. So um, this, he says, this self-consciousness, which qua self-consciousness <clears throat> is other than the object, is left with the lack of harmony, a lack of harmony between consciousness of duty and reality. Pflichtbewusstsein and Wirklichkeit. So these things are clashing with each other. And then he says, and also its own reality. So <clears throat> there's a reality of the world, of, of the all-encompassing reality. And then there's its own reality. And it realizes that none of these are actually mapping onto each other. None of them are jibing with each other. And why does this constitute a real problem here? Well, he says... Um, accordingly, the proposition now runs as follows. There's no moral, perfect, actual self-consciousness. So there's no self-consciousness that is completely moral, completely actual, completely perfect, brought to its fulfillment. And you might say, well, that's, that's fine. You know, everybody fails. Uh, you know, nothing is, is entirely what it is. And yet, when it comes to duty or morality, there's a demand that goes beyond the scope of reality itself, which is kind of a mishmash in that way, and imposes a higher standard. And so what do we get in this ongoing development of the moral consciousness? Something very, very paradoxical that reflects this lack of harmony. He says, since the moral sphere is at all, only insofar as it's perfect, because duty is the pure, unadulterated, intrinsic being or in itself, and morality consists only in conformity to this pure in itself. The second proposition is reformulated, and it says, now again, the, the text, a little bit misleading, there is no moral existence in reality. The German is actually a little bit more blunt. There is no moral Reality. There is no moral actuality. There is no moral, moralitia wirklichkeit. So we're presented here with a paradox because we do have moral consciousness, and yet it doesn't seem like we have morality or moral beings anywhere that we can look and find them. Since, however, in the third place, it is a single self, it is in itself or implicitly the unity of duty and reality. This unity, therefore, becomes an object for it as perfect morality, but as a beyond of its reality, yet a beyond that ought to be actual. Paragraph 614, the penultimate paragraph of this small section on the moral self-consciousness and moral view of the world is very, very short, but it's quite important to see what is going on here. In a way, it's, it's brevity, as opposed to many other paragraphs, allows what is going on to be seen in its, its purity. So he talks about um, the third place, right? Drittens. Uh, because in the third place it is a single, that is ein self, right? Ein selbst. Um, he says it is in itself, this is the consciousness, or implicitly a unity of duty 
and reality, duty and wirklichkeit, actuality, something that, that has genuine being here in the world. And he says this unity becomes an object. Once again, it makes it into an object for consciousness, but it's not an object that it can find out here in the world. Instead, it's something that it is projecting and saying, I should be able to find this somewhere. I just haven't found it yet. And it's something that I need to think as quite possible. And what is this? He says it becomes an object for it as perfect morality. And we should pause here on this perfect word for a moment. That played a role in the previous paragraph, right? Perfect is folendita. This is like perfect when you're reading Greek philosophy. Um, it's not perfect in the sense of just meeting some sort of standard that's been placed out there totally without flaws. It's got a conception involved here of being brought to its fruition, being fulfilled, being at the end of its process of development. So why is there no harmony of morality and, and happiness, morality and nature, the pure practical will and the screwed up wills that we have? Because we're not at the end of the process yet as we ought to be. This is a sort of ameliorative conception, right? Um, and so what we have is something that's ideal as opposed to something that is actual. And what is this perfect morality, you know, making it into an object? He brings up this, this idea of a beyond. He tells us that this is a beyond, a yenzeit, on the other side of its reality. And its reality is... The reality of the moral consciousness. This is something that is beyond its actual experience and even its way of thinking out how this is going to take place. But notice the last thing he says. This is a beyond that ought to be actual. So the ideal, in this case, should be made actual. It's not just an ideal where you're like, well, that doesn't exist, so screw it. Nobody should ever be moral. No, the, the fact that it, it is out there, but not yet actual, means that we should make it actual. So we should make it real. We should make it virklikas. In this goal of the synthetic unity of the first two propositions, the self-conscious reality, that is actual self-consciousness, as well as duty, is posited as only a superseded moment. For neither of these two is single and separate. On the contrary, each of them, whose essential determination lies in their being free from one another, is thus in the unity no longer free from the other, and each therefore is superseded. Hence, as regards content, they become as such objects, each of which counts as object for the other, and as regards form, in such a way that this interchange is at the same time only imagined, that is, occurs only in thought. Or again, the actually non-moral sphere, because it is equally pure thought and is raised above its actual existence, is yet, in imagination, moral and is taken to be completely valid. In this way, the first proposition that there is a moral self-consciousness is reinstated, but is bound up with the second, that there is none, that is, that there is one, but only in imagination. Or in other words, it is true that there is none, yet all the same, it is allowed by another consciousness to pass for one. Paragraph 615 brings this section to a resounding close. And it's also remarkable for a reason that I think those who actually read the phenomenology or follow along with this commentary won't be completely surprised by, and those who get their ideas about Hegel from secondary glosses would in fact be very surprised by, which is that this is one of the rare occasions where we see something like the famous but misleading thesis antithesis, synthesis, exposition of Hegelian dialectic here in the phenomenology. As a matter of fact, Hegel will go so far as to use the term 
synthetic unity, and he uses that, you know, synthesis there. He doesn't call it a synthesis, but he does call it a synthetic unity. And there isn't a thesis, antithesis, you know, but there has been a, a movement there, right? So it's kind of cool to see that happen every once in a while. And this is something where he talks about things being superseded or aufgehoben. So we have this process of aufhebung, the movement to another stage happening here right before we begin the next section. So he begins by saying that there's a goal, a zeal, right, uh, of this synthetic unity of the first two propositions. Where is that goal? It's in the, the last paragraph that we just talked about. The, the third, right? Uh, he says, um, the self-conscious reality, that is actual self-consciousness, as well as duty, is posited as only a superseded, an aufgehobenes moment. So now things have been brought together in a conceptual unity. It says, neither of these is single and separate. Each of them, whose essential determination lies in their being free from one another, being sort of standing on their own, is thus in the unity no longer free, and each is therefore, again, he uses this term, superseded, aufgehobenes, right? So, what does that mean? He says, as regards content, they become as such objects, each of which counts as an object for another. So each of these propositions, the first proposition, there is moral self-consciousness. The second proposition, there is no moral actuality about as far apart from each other as we could get. They are brought together in a kind of synthesis. And what is it? We saw that in the previous paragraph, morality should be actual. That is the thing that unites them together. And in this, both of them become objects for each other. You could imagine them speaking to each other. You know, the one says there's moral self-consciousness and the other one says, that's all BS. There's no morality, man. It's all just whatever is. And then the other side saying, there's no moral actuality. And then the other one asserts, yet we, in even talking about morality, and saying that it's not there, there's something going on, there's something you're not taking account of, and so they, they can become objects for each other within that unity, and that's what allows them to be made sense of. I see this all the time in my ethics classes when I, I begin teaching, and I talk about moral norms, and there are some people who get so boggled by the fact uh, well, there's really two different facts here that illustrate this very well. One is, you'll say, here's a moral norm that you should be observing. And somebody will come along and say, yeah, but people don't observe that. And you'll say, that doesn't actually make it not a norm. And they'll say, well, but I mean, if gravity applies everywhere, that's, that's a norm. That's a law of nature. And you're like, buddy. Physics, ethics, not the same thing. It doesn't work the same way. These are two different ranges of reality. Sure, you can say that you shouldn't lie, and there's all sorts of people out there breaking that rule all the time, or you shouldn't, you know, you should fulfill your promises, or you should be benevolent, and people break these rules all the time. That does not mean that they are not rules. That's the emphasizing this side too much. Then there's the other flip side where people are like, why are we even teaching this? This is all just common sense. Everybody knows that you shouldn't lie. And you're like, well, not everybody does. And of the people who do, many of them find themselves tempted and they, they have this sort of incomprehension that anybody could ever do anything wrong. And when, when you have that, that's a sign of, you know, if not a mental disorder, at least an extremely inflexible consciousness that cannot grasp human realities out there in the world. Um, now, both of those are one-sided positions and are brought together in a higher position that says, yeah, 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 we get it. Morality isn't perfected at this point, And you might even say it doesn't even exist, but yet it should exist. And, and that puts everything into perspective here. So he says... Um, here we go. As regards content, they become objects, each of which uh, counts as an object for the other. As regards form, in such a way that this interchange is very important, is at the same time only imagined, that is, only occurs in thought. And then he says, here's another way to explain it. The actually non-moral sphere, because it's equally pure thought, is raised above its actual existence, 
is yet, and again, again, you see this term, in imagination, moral, and is taken to be completely valid. So he says, in this way, the first proposition is reinstated, but is bound up with the second. He says, there is moral consciousness, but only in imagination. In other words, it is true that there is none, yet all the same, it is allowed by another consciousness to pass for one. So this way in which we parse out morality should be actual is we place it in the realm of imagination, or if you like, uh, the Vorstellung could also mean something that we're sort of projecting out there ahead of ourselves, right? And this is not yet a full resolution of this, this problem, and relying on imagination like that is going to introduce some new problems of its own. But that is where Hegel takes this. 